Stanford University. Welcome to the seminar on people, computers, and design. I'm Terry Winograd. Uh, quick announcement, next week uh, the speaker is going to be Mark Lavoy, who's in the uh, computer science department, the graphics group here. And he's going to be talking about work that he and his students are doing on computational photography. If you take, imagine a camera where you actually can software control all of the different ways in which uh, cameras can be controlled uh, and apply that to the output. What could you do with an open source camera, which is what he's talking about, um, that today you'd like to do, but you can't do with the cameras you get from manufacturers. So uh, they've done a whole bunch of interesting experiments in that direction. He'll be describing that work. This week we have Pam Samuelson from Berkeley, where she's jointly in the law school and the School of Information. And that basically corresponds to her reputation, which is that over Quite a few years, she has been the person who really both understands the technical issues and understands the legal issues. Uh, and I think that's rare. We find a lot of people who, of course, who know the technical stuff but don't know the law and vice versa. Uh, she's published a lot in computer publications, uh, including a regular column in the, in the communications of the ACM, uh, and is sort of the go-to person for people who are in computing and want to understand what the legal issues are with the technical perspective. So the particular issue that she has been looking at recently uh, is one which I'm sure you've all seen in the news, which is what are the legal ramifications of taking all the books in the world, copying them, and then releasing them in various ways. Uh, and that, of course, is what Google has been doing with the books program, stirred up a lot of controversy, and there's a current settlement that's being uh, negotiated between Google and publishers, uh, and that will be the focus. Great. Um, well, thank you for the invitation to be here, um, and thank you for coming. Um, uh, this is uh, turning out to be one of my favorite subjects uh, these days, and so um, I'm always happy to, uh, to talk with uh, people about, uh, about the settlement, and although I'm going to focus today uh, on a lot of the reasons to be at least skeptical, if not opposed, uh, to the settlement, I want to start out by saying I love books. I love the idea of scanning books. I think the brilliance of the technology developments and of the imagination to uh, digitize the major research library collections um, and to make one corpus that then can be, lots of things can be done with, is something that's just extraordinarily good. It's a public good. Um, and so I like the idea, um, but there are some details about the implementation uh, in the Google Books settlement that um, have some, uh, have some uh, serious ramifications. And uh, so I've just been trying to raise some of these issues, uh, not because I don't want a good corpus to happen, and I'm actually okay with Google uh, having a pretty big role in this, but, um, but I think that it's important to really understand that uh, what has happened so far, uh, at least from the standpoint of the, of the proponents of the agreement, is they shine this really bright light 
on all the good things that would happen if the settlement was approved, like you'd have access to more books, and that's good. And they kind of don't pay attention uh, to some of the other details that some of us uh, who are lawyers think are important. Uh, and so uh, part of what I'm going to try to do today uh, is say what some of those other details are that, uh, that maybe we want to know something about. So um, I'm going to real quickly go through uh, things about uh, the project, uh, the status uh, pre-settlement, what the settlement's about, and then try to focus most of my attention on things that are uh, of concern to me and to some other people. So um, we all know that Google started this project in uh, 2004. At the moment, there's somewhere between um, 10 and 12 million books uh, in the corpus, according to the public statements that have been made in the last month or so uh, by uh, people from Google. Uh, the research libraries, uh, Stanford, uh, University of California, and University of Michigan, uh, have made arrangements with Google for their collections to be uh, scanned, and that's really great. Um, so the idea actually is that each of the campuses is supposed to get back a digital copy of the books in their collection, but Google is the only one that will have the entire corpus. And there are lots of restrictions on what universities can do with their, uh, with their library digital copies. Um, about of the sort of, let's say, 10 million, just for ease of conversation, Let's say the 10 million books uh, are in the corpus right now. That's what David Drummond said uh, in September in Congress. About a million, two million or so are in the public domain pretty conclusively. Somewhere in the neighborhood of one to two million are in print and in copyright. And then there's this other six to seven million books that are in copyright probably. Um, uh, but out of print, uh, and the settlement really is about those books in the middle, because uh, under the, under the um, uh, although today you can get snippets of in print books, uh, the expectation has been that any, uh, any rights holder uh, whose in print in copyright book is in the corpus will make a deal uh, with Google through its partner program if it wants Google to be involved in commercialization of that book um, or those books, but uh, they can also ask for their books to be uh, removed from the corpus, which actually doesn't mean that they're really removed, but I'll get to that later. Um, uh, so, uh, the, so public domain books, obviously um, there are no restrictions on them, and as you know, uh, you can download uh, PDF copies of books that are in the uh, in the public domain that are part of the Google Book Search um, repository. So that's, uh, that's all sort of good, uh, good news. Now the Authors Guild and a set of five publishers brought a lawsuit, two lawsuits, in the fall of 2005. Um, and that particular uh, litigation focused on the issue about whether scanning books for the purpose of indexing them and providing little snippets was copyright infringement or not. The Authors Guild and the publishers said that it was copyright infringement, and Google said that it was fair use. And the fair use argument uh, is not a total uh, easy uh, argument, but uh, it is actually uh, one that I was persuaded that uh, they would have won ultimately if the case uh, proceeded. Uh, to litigation because there have been some other cases, particularly um, in the Ninth Circuit, which is here in California, um, that have said that, that, that scanning things to index them is actually uh, a fair use, and I think that, that the reasoning in those cases uh, would apply. Um, there are lots of reasons why uh, Google would want to uh, settle this particular case. Uh, one is that although it ha thought it had a pretty good fair use defense, um, you never know, um, and the exposure that it was facing uh, was pretty substantial. Uh, copyright law right now allows um, uh, recovery of statutory damages uh, uh, up to $150,000 per infringed work. Um, and if you multiply 
uh, the number of books that were being scanned by $150,000 per work for inf willful infringement, you can see that that's a lot of money. Um, and so the motivation to settle, I think, was partly uh, because of the exposure, uh, partly because litigation is, ex is expensive, uh, and what you had is publishers who've been facing a digital world that they've been reluctant to be very kind of experimental with. And along comes Google, and Google has ideas about uh, how to create an en entirely new market uh, through uh, this, uh, uh, through the, its new technologies. Uh, and so uh, fairly early on in the litigation, uh, settlement negotiations uh, started, and um, uh, they spent something in the neighborhood of two to two and a half years negotiating the fine details. They finally announced the settlement in last uh, October. And here's the basic core provisions of the settlement. Google is going to uh, provide $45 million uh, to compensate copyright owners as to books that have already been scanned. That's uh, only $60 per, um, uh, per copyright owner, but um, the, they've, they put a set aside $45 million to, uh, to do that. Um, if you do the math, you can see that they're actually not any close to being as many rights holders as money to give them, but that's another matter. Um, uh, then there was $34.5 million set aside to fund the creation of a new collecting society, the Book Rights Registry, and the idea is that authors of out-of-print books could sign up with the Book Rights Registry and would be able then to benefit not only by getting the $60 if their book had already been scanned, but eligible for um, uh, for receiving funds if uh, uh, they participated in the commercialization that uh, the settlement would allow Google to do. So the initial three services that, uh, that are commercializations of the out-of-print books uh, are first uh, running ads alongside the searches that yield book search uh, results. Uh, to sale of individual books to consumers that are accessible in the cloud. Uh, and then three is institutional subscriptions to uh, a corpus of out-of-print books. Uh, and the rest of the money uh, would go to the lawyers. That's $45.5 million. And I'm sort of like, they didn't do that much work. Um, <laughs> But anyway, um, uh, so and the, and the idea is then Google is going to commercialize these out-of-print books uh, through these various mechanisms. It's going to, uh, for all the money that it collects, 63% of it is going to get shipped off to the Book Rights Registry, and the Book Rights Registry will be tasked with paying that money out to appropriate uh, rights holders. Google will then keep 37% uh, for itself. Uh, the way that the system works, the default rule of this is that uh, Google initially will make a determination about whether a book is in or out of print. If, it's out of, if it determines that it's out of print, then Google will automatically uh, say, I have a right to commercialize this, under, uh, this book under the settlement. Um, and, um, uh, but if it's in print, then the default is no display. Uh, both of those defaults can be overridden. That is to say, the rights holder of an out-of-print book can say, actually, um, I don't want you to commercialize my book. Um, and the rights holder of an in-print in copyright book can also say, I, go ahead and commercialize my book uh, through the same thing that you're doing with uh, out-of-print books. Um, and you can also ask for removal of books from the corpus, but if you look at the definition of the word removal, uh, you will see that it just means that it can't be displayed. Um, so it remains in the corpus so that non-display uses uh, can be made of it, which are a lot of the uses out there. Um, the benefits of the, uh, 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 of the settlement are many. Um, and I'll just show you this slide rather than talk about them. You probably heard them from Google um, or your friends at Google. Um, uh, but the, it's interesting to note that by uh, September 4th, the deadline uh, for giving comments, objections, oppositions, other kinds of commentary uh, on the settlement, uh, so when a class action, what happened was these, this lawsuit started out uh, as a much smaller deal. And then decide the, the, settle, the lawsuit is being settled on behalf of the uh, 
owners of copyright in owners of you owners of copyright where there's a where where they where they have a US copyright interest, okay? Now you'd think, oh, that means the US copyright, but no, what it means is all the books in the world. Um, because of treaty obligations that the United States has, uh, if this settlement is approved, Google will have a license to scan and make the same kinds of uses of all books in the world um, that the settlement allows it to do for the books that it's already scanned. Um, so that's one of the kind of breathtaking parts of the uh, of the uh, of the settlement. So um, uh, the class was, of uh, rights holders was uh, notified uh, about the um, uh, about the uh, about the settlement and given an opportunity uh, to comment. The comment period closed on uh, September fourth of this year, and at the time that the uh, the September fourth deadline came along. Uh, there were 400 submissions, many on behalf of uh, multiple entities, and there were some in support. About 35 of the uh, the submissions were in support, including one uh, by some Stanford computer scientists. Uh, some civil li liberties and disabilities groups also weighed in in favor, uh, and some academics who want to do non-consumptive research um, uh, on the corpus are were supporting it. But the overwhelming majority of the comments that were made uh, were oppositions, and the oppositions came from a lot of different sources. So the governments of France and Germany, for example, uh, have come out solidly against this. Uh, there are also uh, publisher associations and dozens and dozens of publishers from all around the world uh, who are opposed uh, to the settlement, as well as many authors, um, both professional and academic authors, uh, and some publishers, uh, even American publishers, uh, say that there is an unfair burden on them. So there's lots and lots of issues. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that happened in, in September is the U.S. Department of Justice came out uh, with a statement um, came out with a statement against uh, the, the settlement, uh, approval of the settlement on about a dozen different grounds. Uh, most of its concern w had to do with antitrust issues, uh, but some of them also had to do with uh, notions that this was a kind of abuse of class action uh, process uh, and that this is the kind of thing that should be done in Congress, uh, not necessarily by, uh, by litigation. Uh, academic authors and libraries uh, raised a number of issues about the risk of price gouging and some other terms that uh, are of con uh, concern. Uh, there was uh, some concern also about the risk for other mass digitization projects. So uh, you probably have seen that, the, that Sergey Brin and others from Google have said, anybody can do what we did. Um, and I think that's really not true. If the settlement's approved, uh, it uh, it actually is going to be a setback for the next guy's fair use defense uh, because it will be viewed as a kind of concession that it, was uh, that it wasn't necessary, that it was copyright infringement to scan those books in the first place. Uh, and of course, if you really wanted to do something to develop a, a competitive product to a Google Book Search, then you wouldn't be scanning just for the purpose of indexing. You'd be scanning for the purpose of making a corpus that you could then commercialize. And that's no, no one on the face of the earth would say that that's, uh, that that's fair use. So, uh, so the settlement really has some uh, consequences for other mass digitization projects. And libraries today um, are, for the most part, I think quite risk averse about doing digitization projects. Although if Google had won this lawsuit, as almost all of them wanted it to, uh, they would have undertaken some uh, digitization projects too. Um, another cluster of concerns has to do with user privacy, uh, lack of uh, uh, user privacy uh, commitments. Uh, there's lots of concerns by uh, foreign rights holders. Uh, and then there's what uh, my colleague uh, Carla Hesse calls the too big to fail problem. Um, so I'm not going to go into each of those because that would probably take 
all day, but I'm going to try to go through at least some of them. Uh, so let me talk for a minute about class actions, because usually you would think, oh, I don't care. Um, I think you ought to care, because this is fundamentally um, uh, the most aggressive use of a tactic that has ever been tried. Um, and there have been times when people have tried to make kind of bold uses of class actions and have been turned down by the courts because it wasn't consistent with um, the class action process. So let me talk about, uh, about that for a minute. So the idea underlying class actions is kind of interesting. So the notion is that very often uh, corporations can do bad things to people. And if they do bad things to people where each person is hurt just a little bit, it's not going to be worth that person's time and energy to bring a lawsuit to challenge the conduct because it, you could, you, you know, you'd have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a judgment when you only would get $100 at the end. Okay? So it doesn't make any sense. But if the same corporation has been doing that thing to everybody, then the aggregate harm that might be done by that same corporation is, can be pretty substantial. And so if you will find a way to aggregate those claims through this class action mechanism, then uh, you get then to some deterrence by companies uh, against doing bad things. Uh, and also, uh, if the class action settles, or if the, the class action lawyer wins the case, then the members of the class who are injured will be entitled to some benefit. Right, that's kind of the, the basic concept. So, um, so I think you can see that that's kind of a good idea. But usually when there is a class action, it's on one specific issue, and the settlement is only about that issue. Okay? What, was the, what was the issue in litigation in this case? It was scanning for the purpose of indexing the books. That issue has not been resolved by the settlement or by the litigation. In <coughs> fact, Google still keeps saying, we think it's fair use, and the publishers still say it's not fair use. Um, but what they did is they took the occasion of the dispute that they had on that one issue to essentially imagine a new marketplace and to address a set of issues that were, went far beyond the scope of the actual underlying lawsuit. And in the process, expanded the size of the class so that every copyright owner in the world is implicated. Okay, that's millions and millions of people. Okay, and at the same time, expanded dramatically the scope of what was being settled about. And if you kind of think about getting a license to all the books in the world, for $45 million, I mean, you know, they paid $1.65 billion for, uh, for, uh, for YouTube, and yet here they're getting uh, the biggest bargain on the face of the earth, okay? Um, uh, a license for all books in copyright. Now, they can't commercialize the in-print books, but they can still make a lot of uses that are commercially incredibly important to them uh, because the non-display uses that Google can make will allow them to do things like develop new and better automated translation tools, improve their search technologies, uh, and the like. Uh, so it's not as though uh, they don't get a right to make any uses at all of the in-print books. Uh, but when you it vastly expand the size of the class, you vastly expand kind of the scope of it, and it's essentially going forward, right? And not only does the settlement agreement allow uh, for commercialization in these three ways, but it also sets up a mechanism by which all Google has to do to commercialize the books that it has the right to commercialize in different ways, in new ways, is to go to the book rights registry, right, its best friend, and say, I'd like to commercialize these books now. And they say, oh yeah, that sounds good to us too, because we'll still get the same revenue split, um, uh, won't we, uh, for this additional exploitation. Uh, so in some measure, what, you are, wh what you're doing is kind of giving Google a blank check to essentially engage in activity that would be considered clearly infringing activity, but for the settlement and kind of giving a blank check about what uh, all the future uses uh, might, uh, might be. Um, uh, 
there's also a, a questions related to uh, sort of how fair it is to class members, right? The, so the, the people who are the named plaintiff in these cases are, are essentially supposed to be fairly and adequately representing the interests of all people who are in the class. And there are arguments to be made that, that they, they're, you know, they're fair and adequate some, but not necessarily the class as a whole. And so part of what the judge is going to have to decide is whether the man, many, many, many objections that have been made that the, these people didn't adequately represent our interests, how much should that be taken into account? But most of the, uh, of the criticisms or oppositions uh, say, you didn't represent our interest adequately for the following six reasons. Um, OK. Um, and then there's a problem of notice to the class. Uh, so when you're talking about millions and millions of people, I know that Google spent a lot of money on the, uh, on the notice, but it's, um, uh, there are many uh, rights holders who didn't know that they were uh, affected. And, the, um, and the, uh, so there are lots of issues about notice, and the Department of Justice was upset about it too. Um, I'm going to, I think, skip over. Uh, if you want to ask me about the antitrust issues, um, I will be happy to, uh, to talk about them. Uh, we're in a period right now where, uh, because the Department of Justice came in with a strong uh, objection to approval of the settlement, uh, we are now waiting for another version of it, and whether it's going to be um, uh, 2.0 or whether it's going to be 1.1 is one of those questions which we're all looking forward to. Uh, the Department of Justice made so many uh, objections to uh, the settlement that if you took them seriously, the settlement would have to be significantly uh, changed. Uh, but so far as I've been able to tell, the parties are not acting like they need to do more than make some minor tweaks uh, of the agreement. Uh, and so uh, we'll see about that. November 9th is the date that they have told the court that they want to uh, deliver the amended agreement. And then there will be another period of time in which uh, those who objected or opposed or whatever have another opportunity to comment on the, the settlement. Um, the lawyers for, uh, for Google are asking for a truncated um, uh, uh, comment period uh, saying that, oh, the changes we're going to make are going to be good for the class, so don't worry about it. Um, and then they want to settle by the end of the, uh, by the, they want the settlement hearing to happen by the end of the year. I'm not uh, thinking that's going to happen. Now, the particular issues that I have been um, focused on in the letters that I have su submitted have focused uh, on the risk of price gouging. And we all think of Google as somebody uh, as, you know, God, we get so much free stuff from, from them. Isn't this great? Um, they couldn't possibly price gouge. Um, they're just going to be interested in eyeballs. But you know what? When you own a license to all the books in the world, sometimes maybe your business model uh, ideas will, uh, will change. Uh, the prices of institutional subscriptions are supposed to be set based on the number of books uh, in the corpus, uh, the services that are available, and the prices of comparable products and services. Uh, you can see that the first two uh, wouldn't give you much reason to be excited about the idea that prices wouldn't go up. Because as Google adds more books to the corpus, that will give them justification for raising uh, the price. As it creates new services, uh, that also will give a justification. And uh, as Dan Clancy has said in a couple of meetings uh, that I have been uh, at, um, there are no comparable uh, products or services. Uh, and because of the settlement will give Google a license that no one else can get, or at least no one else can get except from Congress, there can be no competing products or services here. Okay, um, So no one else will be able to give a comparably broad um, right, a corpus uh, that could be uh, an institutional uh, subscription. Uh, so I could go on to a lot of other things, but I think what I'm going to say, let's spend just a minute on the too big to fail problem. We all just love the idea of this corpus of books, and we want it to, be, uh, we want, we want it to become a key resource uh, that we have. Uh, but of course, 
Um, there's nothing in the settlement agreement today that would preserve the corpus if Google got tired, if it went bankrupt, if its, uh, if its management changed, right? There's nothing to prevent them from shutting it down, destroying the corpus, and, you know, 10, 20 years out from now, if we have, in fact, become incredibly dependent on this resource, that's a too big to fail problem, right? So uh, there, when you, uh, one of the things that I've been taking to saying a lot lately is when you create a public good this substantial, you have public trust responsibilities as to it. And one of the things that is a public trust responsibility is that there's got to be some sort of mechanism for preserving the public benefits of the corpus and not just saying, well, if the corporation does. Also, Google can sell this thing. Once the settlement agreement is approved, Google can sell the corpus to anybody, anytime. OK? And you know, so suppose they sell it to China. Suppose they sell it to Rupert Murdoch. Suppose they sell it to Reed Elsevier. Okay? Now, if you don't worry about price gouging from Google, maybe you will if it gets sold to somebody else. Um, so what I'm saying here is that a lot of the things that are of concern about, about the settlement really are lacks of sufficient checks and balances and protection of the public interest uh, that comes with this. So even though They've been promoting this as a great public interest benefit. I would say, yeah, but it would be a more public interest benefit if we had some checks and balances uh, in, the, uh, in the agreement. And um, my, my husband's uh, been urging me to write a, a Huffington Post about, uh, about this. What if the servers go down? Google Books. I'm looking for them. 404, Google Books not found. OK, what do we do then? OK, uh, so part of the reason to really want some redundancy here um, is because, uh, right, um, uh, Bryn's uh, uh, op-ed in the New York Times says, oh, we're going to preserve uh, books forever, right? No, we're not going to be the Library of Alexandria, which gets burned to, the, burned to the ground. It's like, yeah, well, it would be better if we had some redundant uh, sort of servers where these things might be found. Uh, so there's um, uh, another sort of dimension to the too big to fail. So let me just say a couple of things about what can the judge do. OK, the basic notion is that litigants can't settle class action lawsuits without a judge approving it. And the issue that is supposed to be for, before the court in a class action settlement is not whether the settlement is in the public interest. I mean, they make, people may make arguments about that, but that's not what the issue is before the judge. Uh, the issue before the judge is whether the, uh, whether the settlement is fair to the class uh, and whether um, um, it, uh, members of the class's interests are adequately uh, taken into account. Uh, and I think the foreign rights holders have the strongest uh, of all the arguments about this, uh, not only because um, many of them didn't get notice directly, even though they are class members, they found out about it through other people, um, uh, but uh, also uh, because the people who negotiated the settlement were members of two organizations which don't allow foreigners to join. Okay, so the notion that they could adequately and fairly represent the interests of foreign rights holders seems kind of implausible. Um, in addition, in order to be able to qualify even for the $60 that you're supposed to get if your book has already been scanned, um, you have to fill out a bunch of paperwork. You can't just say, oh, send me the check. Um, and so uh, in the course of doing that, you also have to have a U.S. taxpayer ID. And it costs $300 to get a U.S. taxpayer ID if you're a foreigner. Um, and so you can see, and you're going to have to pay U.S. taxes um, on any money that comes from the book rights registry. So 
from the standpoint of the, of, of, the, of the foreign rights holders, this is not a fair and adequate settlement. So one of the options is for them to narrow the definition of the class so that foreign rights holders uh, essentially are outside of the agreement. Uh, that's something that the Department of Justice uh, suggested, uh, but uh, that's, not, um, that's not likely in my view. Okay, I'm going to just faint. If, um, if Google redefines the class uh, more, uh, more narrowly. Um, uh, now, one of the things that the judge can do, and judges often do do in class action settlements, is say, I'm concerned about A, B, and C. And although I see some benefits to the class, um, I'm troubled by these things. And I don't think that I can, uh, I can uh, approve the settlement as it's drafted, so go back to the drawing board uh, and address the issues that I care about. Um, and so one of the options here is for the judge to do that. Um, and uh, then, you know, even if the judge uh, does approve the settlement, which I will be just flabbergasted if he does, um, uh, or at least flabbergasted if he does it as is, um, uh, then it will be appealed uh, to the objectors who will be able to appeal uh, approval of the settlement to the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. And this one is a case that because of its scope uh, and breadth and because of the public interest in it um, could go all the way to the Supreme Court. Um, okay, so uh, I think I'm going to just stop there. Um, I'd love to get questions, comments, uh, and all kinds of other things. Yeah. Again, why it would be so implausible for another corporation to do what Google is doing? Okay, sure. So, I think the question is, what's, what is it that they're going to do? Now, when, when, when Bryn says anyone could do what we did, one thing he could mean is anyone can start scanning books for the purpose of uh, indexing them and making snippets available. And that's true. There won't be a, a, a fair use ruling on that matter if the settlement is approved because Google is still saying, oh, we still believe in fair use on this. Um, however, a couple of things are important here, just even for the scanning for the purpose of indexing. Right? One is that the plaintiffs who sue the next guy are going to say, Google settled. That shows that, in fact, this is, um, this is not fair use. Google already conceded that. All right? that's, that's what it's going to look like, I think, to a lot of judges. Also, the argument for the necessity to do this so that you could get access to an index and snippets now is, is undermined because Google Books is already out there and you can get that through, um, through one of the monetization programs. Okay? So the, the necessity argument that I think they had a pretty good uh, argument on uh, is undermined, as is the argument that, um, that it's right. Going into it, nobody, nobody, had been, nobody had settled one of these cases. So settling, this is, an, uh, this is a a very visible settlement. So it just, it queers it a little bit, you know? It, if it was like, it was a pretty close fair use case before, I think this sets, it, sets the fair use defense back, and I think most copyright lawyers would say the same thing. But at this point, what we're dealing with is not, uh, right, if you wanted to do what they did, then you'd scan books in order to make a commercial service. And there's no way that that's fair use, okay? Just no way. No, I mean, you would get laughed at a court um, uh, if you claim something like that is fair use. So uh, in some sense, you could say, well, they were just lucky, right? They scanned for one purpose, and then it, they had this opportunity to, to make this other um, uh, choice um, or when, the, when the publisher said, let's make a deal. Um, now, you know, one of the briefs that was submitted in this case by somebody from Harvard Law School who usually knows better um, says, well, you know, anyone else can, you know, just bring on, bring on a class action lawsuit. You know, it's like, you know, I mean, it's, it's irresponsible, okay, to start scanning for the purposes of trying to develop competing product, hoping a class action lawsuit is brought against you, and then hoping that you would be able to settle that class action lawsuit on the same terms for the same cheap amount. 
Okay, totally, totally implausible. Okay, cannot be done. You talk about treaties, but can you explain more why uh, internal U.S. Uh, litigation have this implication for the whole world? Sounds yeah. like it's bizarre. Um, so here's the here's the notion. Okay, when the United States or any of the other countries uh, that are members of these international treaties, what they do by joining the treaty is say, I will extend copyright protection to your, your, n your nationals' works in the United States, and you also recognize copyright from U.S. authors in these other countries. Okay, so, so everybody has a U.S. comp... If, you, if you're a member of a treaty union um, kind of country, and you're a national of one of those countries, then you have a Zimbabwean copyright interest even as a US author or a French one or a New Zealand one or whatever. Okay, so so there's kind of this, the treaties just recognize that all of them. So the the judge only can adjudicate as to the US copyright interest, right? So if Google started scanning in copyright in print books in France, for example, that wouldn't be activity that it could claim was covered by the settlement agreement. But if it ships the books from France to the United States, scans them in the United States, and then only makes them available to US citizens, which is or US, US entities, then that's consistent with what the, what, what the court adjudicated in that particular case. Okay? So one of the things that that does is it sets up what I'm calling Google's glo global play, right? So the notion is if, if everybody in the United States has the benefit of the, the, you know, these millions and millions of books in the corpus, and oh, we're learning so many more things, and we're going orders of magnitude, uh, increases in educational yada yada, okay, then other countries are going to say, whoa, why, why can't we get this? And then the, com company, uh, you know, the countries will say, oh, well, okay, well, as long as you pay our people too, um, you know, you kind of then, then will agree kind of country by country to extend this. So the global play then, uh, I think, is to make this through a kind of, you know, get it approved in the United States and then go around to the rest of the world and say, wouldn't you like the benefits? Um, and uh, to the extent that they're signing up publishers outside the United States, they'll say, wouldn't you like uh, for your books to be available in your own country too? And hey, we can help with that. Um, so they're you know, it's a, it's a, it's just a brilliant, brilliant deal, brilliant. Um, I know public option is a controversial idea these days, but can you talking about the role of the Library of Congress? Um, yes, some people are. Um, in fact, um, there is a not very vocal, but uh, I think growing conversation among people who care about the future of books and who like the public goods aspect of this uh, to think about uh, some other initiative and the Library of Congress would be an obvious um, entity to do it because it has a pretty big collection of books too. And in fact, the government of Japan uh, has just set aside um, some hundreds of millions of whatever um, uh, to digitize the library for the Diet of Japan. So essentially, it's kind of Library of Congress type thing. And Korea has also done something like that. So um, there are possibilities of doing that. I think that uh, also a number of American uh, universities uh, would be happy um, to digitize their collections and, 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 and make cooperative agreements with, other, with others to make a, a corpus, uh, again, of, of public domain and out-of-print books that could be available uh, uh, very broadly, uh, but that's going to take some money and that's going to take some political leadership, and right now um, money is not so easy to find. Although, you know, if you think about it, you could make a, you could make a corpus of 20 million books for probably $600 million. And when you kind of think about the TARP funds and stuff like that, it's like that's a drop in the bucket. Um, so it's not, it's not impossible to do, um, but it would, have to, it would have to take leadership from Congress 
um, to say this is an important, you know, this is a, this is a, you know, this is our cultural heritage, right? Um, that we should be uh, actively preserving and let Google do it too. But the notion that one private company is going to have this broad um, uh, a, a right and a monopoly over that is really is deeply troubling. Yes. Well, uh, uh, the House of Representatives had a hearing in September um, uh, about the Google Books uh, settlement, and so, uh, and I, I've talked to people on the Senate side that there's interest there too. But um, you know, I think part of what's happening right now is Congress is waiting to see what the court is going to do, and then obviously, if the uh, if the uh, settlement is not approved which is a real possibility. Um, I think Google's making it sound like a oh, piece of cake. Um, but I think, it's, uh, I think it's a not clear thing at all. But if Congress, uh, if, if the court decided not to approve it, I think then Congress would probably start getting interested in it. And, uh, and one of the things that could happen is uh, that Congress could decide, yes, this is in the public interest, but we need these additional checks and balances um, in it. And other people should be able to get the same license to the orphan works uh, that Google is going to get through the, through the settlement. So uh, right now, the Department of Justice is kind of slyly suggesting that, um, that, uh, that Google and the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers find a creative way to give others than Google the same license that Google is going to have to the orphan books. The orphan books are the books that um, if you try to track down the rights holder, you can't find them. Um, and you know, there's a big debate about how many orphans there really are. Some people think the majority of the books that are out of print are orphaned, and some people think only 2% of them are orphaned. Um, David Drummond, in his testimony before Congress, suggested that it was about 20%. My guess is it's larger than that, uh, particularly since we're talking a lot of, about a lot of foreign books, and they're not going to be easy to locate in the United States. Um, so, um, so that could give some impetus to orphan works legislation, which has been introduced in Congress and the Copyright Office have actually been supportive of orphan works legislation. Um, and Google is saying, oh, well, orphan works legislation will become more likely if uh, the settlement is approved. I think that's what they'd say in order to get everybody to uh, calm down. But I think it would actually take the wind out of their, uh, the sails of any orphan works legislation, whereas if the court turns it down, all of a sudden the action does shift to Congress. So project, there would be a lawsuit, there would be a settlement, people would object to the settlement, there would eventually be legislation. <coughs> then somebody smarter than I am. Oh, okay. so taking a view from 35,000 feet, is that the way these kinds of things have unfolded over the history of law? Well, it's certain people fight for a while and then eventually the lawmaker yes. body picks yes. it? Yes, and in fact this is far from the first class action lawsuit uh, that's uh, been brought in the copyright space. Um, so a number of other uh, the Amazon brief does a really brilliant job of showing examples of controversies about new technology issues. They're almost always new technology issues, where there's an argument here and there's an argument there. And they, a class action lawsuit starts, and they fight for a while, and then it goes to Congress, and Congress fixes it. Um, and so there's a pattern of that in the past. Um, I think that Google would much prefer uh, that it uh, be done by the, by the judge. Um, uh, and actually, the first thing Dan Clancy ever said to me when he came to talk to me about this was, Pam, we have to do this through the class action settlement process because Congress is broken about copyright law. And my response to this is, OK, so you think one branch of the government is, uh, is broken, so let's break another part of it in order to uh, overcome the problems with that one. I think that's just too cynical, um, frankly. Um, what the scope of the settlement agreement is so vast that it's truly a legislative matter. It is not. Um, it's, not, a, it's, not it's not a class. This is not a class action settlement 
This is the, uh, using the existence of a lawsuit on one issue to restructure the market and make it like Halloween, make it look like a class action settlement. Clarification about class, class action is the Google is asking the class, I mean, because it look like they are the general motors and to, uh, trying to represent the drivers or the car owners. So, so who, is the, who is asking for the class, class action or defining the class action? Yeah. Class. So, class action lawsuits are often brought with a certain class defined. Usually you try to define the class fairly narrowly because the broader you define the class, the more difficult it is to credibly come into the court and say, I, uh, I, I'm adequately representing all of the members of the class because class members often have diver diverse interests. So for example, there's another lawsuit that was brought against uh, Google um, a couple of years ago. Um, a brought as a class action lawsuit involving trademark issues. And Google was able to persuade the court that class members had d two diverse interests, including two diverse a set of opinions about the legal question that this part, the, the, that this lawsuit was trying to address. And the court refused to certify the class and dismissed the class action. So, um, so you try to sort of define a class that you think you can, you can get. But very often, if, you, if, the, if, the, if the company that uh, has been sued um, wants to be able to kind of get rid of lawsuits of this sort, it's sometimes the defendant who usually wants the class either not to be certified at all or if certified to be certified as a narrow class if they are going to essentially uh, um, settle a lawsuit, not only on behalf of the people who are just like them, but you know, might be somewhat similar, then the defendant often has an interest in broadening the class. Okay? And I think that's true in this case. That, that Go it, it is as much Google's interest for the class to be defined as all copyright owners in the world as you know, as the as for the for the um, the Authors Guild and the Association of American Publishers, they have been purporting to represent the interests of all authors on the one hand and uh, publishers on the other, and you know they their first uh, the the class action lawsuit that was filed in two thousand five claimed to represent uh, all owners of copyright interests of authors of books in, in the University of Michigan library. Okay, so it was a much more narrow de narrow, narrowly defined class. So I think Michigan has something like five million books maybe that they've made available to, to Google to scan. So, you know, that's less than all the books in the world. So, so the class got expanded dramatically. And you want to do that in order to just say, okay, now I'm selling this to everybody. Um, and that makes it more valuable to you. Yeah, I'm also a little bit confused about the idea of a class action lawsuit, but rather than ask the same question again, I'd, I'd ask, is there some sort of parallel between what's happening here and what happened with digitization of music? Um, why can't there, instead of saying we have one lawsuit that represents all um, books in the world, why can't we say, well, unless both the author and the publisher sign off on it, Google can't archive it? Or, you know, well, why can't we say that they can just sign on the price or, I don't know, break yeah, it Yeah, so I think there are two responses to that. Um, uh, one response is that if you wait for the orphan book authors to show up, you'll die without getting an answer. So um, some Fairly substantial, I'm going to just say, I'll accept David Drummond's uh, estimate right now, that 20% of the books um, are, are orphaned. It means that nobody can commercialize them if the rights holder has to show up and affirmatively say yes. So an advantage of the license that Google would get is that it could commercialize the books 
then develop a revenue stream, and this is very clever, the, then the revenue stream goes to the book rights registry. If some of the orphan books turn out to be incredibly desirable, right? Now, the, 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 the really interesting thing is like, are orphan books valuable or not? Sort of nobody knows, really. Now, the argument is, well, they've been out of print, though they're not valuable. It's like, that is baloney, OK? Because the economics of the digital publishing situation are totally different from the economics of traditional book uh, publishing. Uh, one source uh, that, I, uh, that I came across said Google will be able to uh, recoup its investment for selling the books. Um, once for digitizing the books, you know, in a couple of sales, because um, it's like thirty dollars a book to scan it. Okay, so it only takes a couple of sales to recoup that uh, particular amount. Um, so, uh, so the orphans are ones that, if you wait for the rights holders, you're never going to make those books available. So, everybody thinks that the orphan book should be available, and it may be that if money flows and hey, there's $100,000 waiting for this uh, orphan author, then somebody from the book re registry will go try to find that person. Say, hey, don't you want your $100,000? Um, so that's a way, right? So the notion is that if you get this machine going, right, this uh, revenue stream, then orphans will kind of come out of the work, or the parents of the orphans will come out of the woodwork um, and readopt them and take them home. Um, okay, so that's one thing. Um, and the other thing is that even for books where you could locate the rights holder, it's expensive to do one by one. And so um, what, what Google has realized is that if I can get a license to all the books in the world, then if the rights holders care, they'll come forward and say, do this or don't do this. And so from their argument, their argument is that transaction costs argue in favor of they're doing what they do, okay? That they that they're making an efficient uh, uh, efficient uh, decision about this. So what should happen to the money of books whose authors never come forward? I mean, in, in your sense, sort of morally or ethically, rather than yeah. like the well, let me tell you first what the settlement agreement said about this, okay? Because this is really pretty interesting. So. The settlement agreement essentially says that if after the first five years of the operation of the Google commercialization of these books, the orphan book holders, uh, book rights holders don't come forward, we'll just pay all the money that was collected for them out to us, the other registered rights holders. And the Department of Justice said, hey, wait a minute, okay, you don't own any rights in those books. Uh, what makes you think that you're entitled to a windfall payout on them? Uh, and I think something like six states came in and said this, uh, this dimension of the, of, the, uh, of the settlement is actually um, inconsistent with state unclaimed funds laws. Um, and the Department of Justice objected to it also, saying that it created a conflict of interest within the class because registered rights holders would just assume that the unregistered rights holders never show up because I'm going to get it all for myself um, uh, if, uh, if those guys don't show up. Okay, so to, to, I think that the, one of the things I'm quite sure will be changed about the settlement agreement uh, will be some change about that. Now the question is what kind of change uh, should be made? Um, one possibility, which the Justice Department suggested, is that you spend the money looking for the parents of the orphans um, rather than on kind of paying it out. In fact, they, they had such, a, uh, such, such an expectation that there were going to be just millions and millions and millions of dollars to be paid out to all the rights holders, um, that they had a little thing that if there's any left over after we've not only sort of compensated our rights holders but also spent all the orphans' money, um, but if there's any left over for that, then we will uh, 
book rights registry will pick its favorite charity and give some money to the charity. It's like, okay. Now, you wonder why I'm worried about price gouging, right? If they are planning through this agreement uh, to essentially subsidize their favorite charities after paying themselves handsomely, um, it doesn't seem to me like they're thinking about low prices. Okay, that's really something. So that's one thing you could do is just um, use the money to find the, the orphan rights holders um, in the in the um, in the submission that I made to the judge uh, on behalf of some academic authors, I suggested that you use that money to lower the price of institutional subscriptions. Um, so that's another thing could be done with it. Um, I don't think that's what <laughs> I don't think that's what the amended agreement is going to do. I think it's more likely that they'll adopt the suggestion from the Department of Justice. Yeah. Just very, very briefly, a little on privacy issues. But I can sort of think of maybe three categories. One, the direct one, does this settlement affect privacy with respect to use? By particular Number two, is, is there any way in which copyright has been used to ensure privacy that might be reached by this agreement? And then third, the more longer term view is if Gordon Bell's view of, of the, lo the law of life comes. 20 years down the line, could the same play be made against the law? <laughs> okay, um, I think I know the answer to the first one uh, uh, fairly easily. So, um, the, a reason why there has been so much emphasis in the submissions to the court about privacy issues uh, is that many, many provisions in the agreement call for monitoring usage kind of on an individual basis. So when, and, uh, and it's kind of ironic that the only provision out of dozens of provisions that call for monitoring, the only provision that speaks to privacy at all is a privacy policy for rights holders. So that if rights holders who sign up with the Book Rights Registry don't want their name and telephone number to be available to uh, anyone who wants it, they get that data private, right? So the fact that they took care, right, the, 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 uh, the Authors Guild and the publishers basically took care of their privacy and then said, let's, but let's basically collect all this data about everybody else, um, kind of seemed imbalanced to me. Um, and so uh, there is a lot of interest in trying to uh, develop uh, policies uh, that address the, the privacy issue. So the Electronic Frontier Foundation's brief uh, to the court on behalf of privacy sensitive authors is something that I would look to uh, if I were you and you were interested in that dimension. Um, yes, and, and actually if, uh, if you want to know, I'm a little disappointed that the libraries didn't do anything really for privacy um, in the negotiations. They were involved quite intimately with the negotiations about certain aspects of the settlement agreement. Um, and you would have thought, since they have this historical role, uh, that they would be sensitive to it, but they haven't been. Um, so, I mean, privately they'll say, oh, I'm really worried about this too. Um, but, you know, when it came to sort of negotiating, Maybe they tried, but they didn't make any headway. Um, so in terms of the, the, the copyright as a way of protect privacy, there are times when if somebody is about to publish your private diary, you could stop that from happening. But copyright really is about kind of re economic regulation more than anything else. So it's not really used uh, commonly to protect um, privacy. And then I don't know how to answer the other question. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Explain further uh, how the actual figures involved are arrived at, because it seems like, well, first of all, I don't know what the actual precedence is behind that, but also um, it seems like the actual worth of the copyrights involved is going to be really heavily tied to how the information is actually used. So, so what's going on? What's going on there? Well. Um, the parties agreed to $125 million. I think uh, it had to have um, 
it had to have nine figures in it where it wouldn't look like a serious settlement. Um, uh, to a lot of the objectors, the $60 per scan book doesn't seem even close uh, to being a fair uh, piece of change. Uh, but um, I'm just going to leave that aside. That's what they negotiated. Um, the, I think the argument that they would make about why this isn't a ripoff uh, of, uh, of uh, the rights holders' interests is that, um, look, we're creating a new means for you to commercialize your books, particularly books that are out of print and therefore are not offering you any value today, tomorrow, excuse me, once our machine gets going, um, there will be then streams of revenue to you and you'll be glad we did it in the long run. I think that would be uh, that would be their, their argument. And so, you know, D David Drummond says, we're going to breathe new life uh, into uh, out-of-print books. Uh, and I think actually they were brilliant in recognizing that although many books are out of print, um, that doesn't mean that in fact they're valueless or that if they were easily available uh, in a cheap fashion, that there wouldn't be a market for them. So I think it was a, I think it was a, a brilliant move. So when, when David Drummond goes before Congress and says, oh, these books, they're out of print, they're valueless, and nobody worries about them, it's like, excuse me, you would not be spending hundreds of millions of dollars, okay, on this project if you thought they were trash, okay? Just let's be clear about that. Um, and so I, I, I you know, they're, but they're so brilliant. I have to say, the public relations talent in that company is really, really breathtaking. Not too big to fail. Yes, we had a recent case where people didn't want to let it fail. But what about AT&T? Remember, a breakup of AT&T? Could we see a breakup of Google or Google Books? Well, I, you know, I... Would that solve the problem, for instance? Well, I, I certainly think that there are things that could be done. Um, and maybe the antitrust division will be the entity to help structure this. And in fact, that's what they have been in conversation uh, with, uh, uh, with Google. They, and they sent a letter to the court, I believe in May, saying that they had opened an inquiry and had actually um, uh, opened an investigation about this and had started issuing civil investigative demands, uh, which is kind of what they do when they're kind of serious about something. Um, the judge wrote back to them and said, I want a report from you by September 18th because he was expecting to hold the fairness hearing on October 7th. So he wanted an opportunity to get their views. And although the Department of Justice came in and recommended against the uh, approval of the settlement in its current form, uh, said that it was in conversation with the parties and wanted to help them to work out something that actually could become acceptable. So um, as I said earlier, the number of issues that they raised uh, is quite large, and most of them would not be simple uh, matters to uh, accomplish. But one of the things that they are trying to do is figure out a way so that competition could happen, right? Right now, the concern is that there will be a foreclosure of, com of meaningful competition um, in the corpus of books to be available as ins for institutional subscriptions unless somebody else can get the same license, at least to the orphans, that, that Google would get. The point is not that competition is redundancy. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's what I because totally want, I saw you nodding like when, books, I, when I talked about that. Yes. Redundancy. Yes. Right. Exactly. You want the last book not to be found. Yes. Exactly. So it has to be dark. Okay. Um, a question from the back? Um, you've mentioned about international publishers, uh, international publishers. So, uh, and obviously they do not have getting anything but giving many things to this uh, 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 settlement. And uh, also you've mentioned about the tension between society and technology. So new technologies also have some tensions between um, its application in society. And actually, um, Japanese Information Processing Society uh, just gave an announcement, an official announcement, um, saying that we are opposed to this kind of application of technology because of the class and 
class action needs to go, and right. it's really um, ten, it gets um, tensions between society and technology much bigger. So we, so, uh, the, uh, the information processing society in Japan, uh, their um, uh, com computer scientists and engineers um, society, so they just gave <laughs> a public announcement. So I suppose there are similar opposed opposition from in many countries. So what do you think about this action and the broadness of the class action? Well, you know, the, the number of objections and criticisms of the settlement, what I've been told, and I'm not a class action specialist, um, is that, that there have been more objections to this settlement uh, than any other in the history. And the judge basically was out of his mind because the, you know, they got 400 submissions in a short period of time, and that was a lot of paperwork to deal with. Um, so, um, uh, but I think that if more of the people who were actually affected knew about it and realized, there would have been 4,000, 5,000, 10,000 more because the number of copyright owners affected by this is extremely large. Um, so um, again, I think foreign rights holders have the strongest uh, set of objections. I think that there are some serious objections also from US authors. Um, but I think that um, this is an issue that probably will be debated um, within not only publishing and author communities, but also uh, you know, information processing societies, uh, as you say, because uh, we're, you know, this affects deeply all of us. Um, and so uh, we want the corpus of books. There's a huge public good there. Um, now we just got to make sure that there's some checks and balances in place so that the risks of bad things happening are reduced. Thanks. Thank you. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.